Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to Wednesday worship here at Kennesaw United Methodist Church. I'm Lindsay. Um, as you may know, if you've been tuning in with us every week, and I'm the, the director of modern music here, or modern worship. And we're excited to have you here tonight, uh, or just have you tuning in through Facebook or YouTube. And we just welcome you to, uh, even though you're, we're just seeing each other through a screen, we welcome you to really praise and worship and just allow God to do what he can through you and do something through you and just connect with him. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, though, before we get started with music um, so that we can kind of set the intention for the rest of this night. Father, we come here wanting to truly lay our hearts before you or even to forget about what's been going on lately to just, we are just always waiting for the next thing to happen so we feel like we can finally be at peace. When really, we just need to give ourselves to you. For the world is always going to be changing. It's always going to be moving around, around us. And we need to just look to you for peace and consistency. So I pray that we do that tonight and just remind ourselves that you are always there. You are always present. Your love is always surrounding us. Let's not look to worldly things to do that for us. Let's go to God. In your name we pray. Amen.
ever seen Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you
more time. Let's proclaim that we're not going to put our trust in things that are impermanent. We're going to put our trust in things that are permanent, and that is God's love. to this next song let's um as we proclaim to be the foundation let's ask god to um allow us to open our eyes and see things or maybe the way we didn't see them before Spirit, come make us humble. 
that we do, you are above everything else. Part of the reason I love this medley of Give Us Clean Hands with this bridge from Came to My Rescue by Hillsong is because I think the two just go so well together. As you have this song that's asking for you to give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, and reflect upon ourselves, and ask whether or not we are truly putting you above everything else and what you've taught. So that's why I pray, in my life, be lifted high, in my world, be lifted high, in my love, be lifted high. In all things, you should be lifted high above everything else. So that's why I pray for us tonight, is that we lift you above everything else. And now, I just pray that in that spirit, we receive the words that Lori is about to preach. With that in mind, that we are putting God above everything else. In your name we pray. Amen.
Good evening, and I also would like to welcome you to our Wednesday worship sessions. I'm Lori Klingenberg, the associate pastor here at Kettleslaw United Methodist Church, and I know that Lindsay and the band have gotten you into the spirit of worship, and you are ready to continue in that worship through the hearing of the word. So, a week ago was Ash Wednesday, and so we are now in Lent. And Lent is the season of the year that leads up to Easter. It is a season where we are in repentance. Many times you might hear your friends, well, I gave up coffee for Lent, or I gave up chocolate for Lent, or I gave up this, that, or the other thing. Or maybe you'll hear someone say, I decided to pick up this spiritual practice and to try and make it a habit in Lent. And it's, the, it's just that season that as we, as we go through the church year, we get ready to celebrate Easter. But before we get to Easter, we have to get through the passion and the crucifixion well before we get to the resurrection. And as we think about the passion, the thing that comes to mind for me is the movie. It was back in 2004. It was Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. Now, there's been a lot of things that have swirled around Mel Gibson and a lot of things that have swirled around this movie, but it was still a really eye-opening movie. And throughout my journey in faith, there have been moments in time that have, and events that have defined my faith. And the movie, The Passion of the Christ, was one of those moments. I can remember, I don't go out to movies a whole lot um, because I find them to be pretty expensive and sometimes pretty loud. And I'm just not much of a moviegoer, but... When this movie came out, this was one that I wanted to see. And, of course, <clears throat> my youngest child was really little, so he couldn't go. So Michael and myself, we went to see the, the Passion of the Christ. And when it reaches the point where Jesus is arrested and put on trial, you start to begin to understand that things are happening. But for me... The moment that shook my world the most was when they started beating Jesus. And seeing the, the cat and nine tails or, or the, the thing that they flogged him with and the, the bits of metal and bone that they put at the ends of them to do maximum damage really rocked my world. And for that part of the movie, up through the crucifixion, I'm watching it like this, through my fingers, because it was, it was so horrific. And for me, in that moment, I began to realize what it was exactly that Christ had done for me. That moment in time, that movie, that section moved me from a place of comfort. I grew up in the church. I only vaguely remember when I accepted Christ as my Savior. But this moment was a defining moment. It was a moment that stuck with me, and it moved me from that place of comfort where I was going along, yeah, I went to church, maybe even involved in a little ministry, teaching on, you know, in Sunday school and places like that. But I was comfortable. I was just living my life, and that's just the way it was. And we all have those times where we reach a place of comfort in our faith journey, and we stop for a moment, maybe longer than a moment. We stop. And we just pitch our tent and we get comfortable. But faith is a journey. Our relationship with God is a journey. It's not something where we should stop and stay. It's something where we should keep on moving. 
But it's so easy to stop and rest. And inertia kicks in. And once we stop and rest, it's really hard to get moving again. Until we encounter a moment that jump starts our desire to keep moving. And we're going to look at today's passage. It's in 1 Peter. And we're going to read chapter 3, verses 13 through 22. And I had an initial reaction when I, was, when I was reading it. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter. It's way back at the back of the Bible. Before the three Johns. Before Revelation. But not much before those. So I'm going to invite you to turn with me. I'm reading from the New International Version today. I hope that's what I told Dimitri, because that's what I'm reading for, reading from. And it says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, for the righteous, for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now last week, as I was reading this scripture and preparing to put together this word, I got through reading it the first time, second time, the third time, and I was like, I got nothing. I have no idea. Eh, I don't know what to say about this. This is one of those passages where we might be left scratching our heads. But when you get to the crux of it, when you get down to really in depth, deep into it, it comes down to this. Christ suffered for us. And even if we're in the middle of our own sufferings, for, for whether it's for our faith or for other reasons, Christ suffered for us. And as Christians, as people who follow Jesus, if we're going to take some heat, and we are, we're going to take some heat, we should take it for doing good and not evil. And somewhere in all of that, there's this blessing. This blessing that we receive if we're suffering for Christ's sake. If we're suffering because we've done what's right, if we do, we've done what's good. And not what's evil. Now, in the climate in our country right now, there are a lot of people pointing fingers, making statements, and maybe dodging some blame. And they're taking some heat for some of their actions. And that heat maybe is not for actions that were so good. But there are people that are taking heat for choices that they've made that are for doing good and not for doing evil. 
and their careers may take a hit for it. But they stand by what they believe, and they stand by what they know is right. And when I look at that, I see Christ. And Christ's suffering, the beating that he took for us, the agony that he suffered on the cross, he did for our salvation. He did so that he could get to the resurrection, which brings us to God and reestablishes our relationship. But there's some things that should happen when we, when we contemplate, when we think about all that Christ did for us, all that he suffered for us. And if you haven't seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ, I encourage you to do so because it really, the depiction of the suffering is so vibrant and so vivid. It, you really get to feel like you understand what it is he did. I will warn you, if you got a queasy stomach, it might be hard to watch. I was never able to watch it except through my fingers. But there are things that happen or should happen when we recognize all of the suffering, the agony, the misery, the pain that Christ suffered for us. The first thing it should do is it should compel us to set apart time for spiritual reflection and growth. When we see what the Son of God went through for us, for you, and for me, it should push us to want to grow in spiritual life. It should push us to want to go in deeper in the relationship with God. It should cause us to look inward and see where we need to grow. It should compel us to examine our relationship with God. God didn't send Jesus to earth simply for the forgiveness of our sins. That's part of it. Jesus absolutely died for sin, our sins once and for all. But that's not why God sent him. God sent him to reestablish a rela broken relationship. And so when we contemplate and think about all that Jesus suffered for us, even before his arrest and beating and crucifixion, but just even living life in first century world, all that he suffered for us should compel us to evaluate where God is in our lives, how close we are or how far away from God we are. And then thirdly, it should compel us to reflect on our own character and our own behavior. When we look at ourselves in the mirror, do we see Christ shining out from our eyes? Does our character and our behavior, the way we act, is it loving towards those that Christ also came to this earth for? There's not a person living or gone or going to be that Christ did not come for, did not suffer for, did not die for. And when we look at, when we look at ourselves, does our actions reflect that? Does, do our actions look like the actions of Jesus? Now, as humans, as people... When we're suffering, when someone causes us suffering, we have ways that we react. Not all of us are super peaceful. My own initial reactions to someone hurting me, to someone causing me to suffer, is to fight back. I'm going to come out swinging. But Christ didn't come out swinging. When they were scourging him with the cat of nine tails when they were hammering the nails into his hands and feet when they were raising the cross 
he did not retaliate. He said, God, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And he wasn't necessarily talking about their knowledge of the pain that they were inflicting upon him. They absolutely knew what they were doing there. But they didn't know who they were doing it to. And they didn't know that by doing it to the Son of God that they were preventing it from happening to themselves. Our reaction to someone causing us to suffer, our reaction for when we take heat for doing good, should be non-retaliation. And I, when, when I think about that non-retaliation, I think about my childhood and growing up. And I'm the oldest of three. My sister is the middle child and my brother is the youngest. Now my brother was an instigator. And he loved to pick at my sister. They were only 14 months apart, so they were pretty close in age. And he loved to pick at my sister. He loved to make her holler. He loved to see how much trouble he could get her in because she always retaliated. She always struck back. And she was always the one that got caught. She didn't start it. She wasn't really at fault. She wasn't really to blame. She was simply reacting to what was being done to her. But she was always the one that got caught and got in trouble. The one who retaliates is the one who gets caught. But non-retaliation does not mean that you are silent. There are times in Jesus' trial when he was silent, and there are times when he was not. But Peter tells us here that when people are giving us some heat for the good that we're doing, Peter tells us here that when we are suffering for Christ, that we are to be ready to always speak of the reason why we have hope. Even in the midst of our suffering, even in the midst of our pain, even in the midst of us being persecuted or slandered or mocked or made fun of, we are to be ready to always give a reason why we still have hope in Jesus Christ. And we're to do it with gentleness and respect. To ease into it. Not retaliating doesn't mean being silent. Just as when Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi would preach nonviolence in their respective struggles, in their respective fights for freedom, and they would preach nonviolence. But nonviolence is not non resistance. Not retaliating doesn't mean we're silent. Not retaliating doesn't mean that we are not resisting what is happening to us. But it means that we're using gentleness and respect. And that we are remembering that Christ suffered to, uh, for us. And that Christ's suffering should move us from our place of comfort and keep us moving on our journey of faith. But we're always to speak of our hope. But to be honest, this passage really doesn't sound hopeful. It talks about Jesus suffering for our sins, for my sins, and for your sins. And it talks about how we're going to suffer, even though... Peter starts out kind of tongue-in-cheek. Who's going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Knowing that the people that he's writing this to are being persecuted. Knowing that the people he's writing this to are being harmed for doing good. He's saying, I see your suffering. And I'm just reminding you that Christ suffered for you. And so in this suffering, there is blessing. 
But that doesn't sound very hopeful or helpful. Where is the hope in that? Where is the hope in Jesus' suffering? Where is the hope in our suffering? The hope is in that, in this passage, Jesus rose again. Jesus is no longer dead. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God Almighty. And God is sovereign over death. Death does not have the last word. Death is not the end. During this Lenten season, we focus a lot on that death. We focus a lot on all that Christ went through. But Sunday's coming. God is sovereign over death. The other hope that is here is as Peter is acknowledging that, that as Christians, we're going to be harmed for doing good. We're going to be harmed for following Christ. The hope is that in that Jesus has already been there. Jesus has already been where we are. Jesus has been tempted. We read that in the Gospels where he goes out into the wilderness and Satan comes and tempts him. He's been beaten. He's been mocked. He's been ridiculed. He's been killed. He's already been where we are. And the third reason for the hope is that Jesus' suffering was our salvation. In Jesus' suffering, our salvation comes. In Jesus' beating, in his death, and in his resurrection, we can live again. We will one day walk with God. We will one day see Jesus face to face. Because death is not the end. And Jesus has been when we're, where we're at. And Jesus came to bring us salvation. And that, that is good news. That is amazing news. That the God of the universe, the creator of all that we see and don't see, loved us so much that he was willing to come down as a person, as a human being, willing to suffer and die for us so that we can be with him now and forever. Let's pray. Gracious, holy, amazing, loving God. You sent your son here to earth to suffer, to be beaten, to be crucified, to be ridiculed, to be mocked, to be hated. All for us. All so that we could once again, live in a restored relationship with you. Once again, so that there would be hope. Hope that death is not the end. Hope that one day everything will be restored to the way it was originally created. And you chose to come and suffer because you chose to work through us to bring your kingdom into this world through us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for loving us so much. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.
purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Lindsay's rearranged things up here a little bit, so I'm, I'm <laughs> not sure where I'm supposed to stand. <laughs> we are in the season of Lent, and it is a time for reflection and repentance and just remembering everything that Christ has done for us and the way that he lived his life, the way that he died, and eventually the way that he rose again. But Lent is that time that we focus on the days leading up to the resurrection. And I invite you to take this time, this, this, these 40 days, to look inward and reflect on the places where Jesus shines brightly in your life and the places where maybe not so much. And look for the places where you can continue your journey and you can move from your place of comfort and you can walk faithfully with God. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with us through this season of Lent as we prepare our hearts for the resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <laughs>